ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಶಿಲ ಪ್ರಭು ಪಾದ್ ಕಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ಗೌರ ಚಂದ್ರ ಕಿ ಹಿಸ್ ಹೋಲಿನ ಚಂದ್ರ ಮಾಲಿ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಕಿ ವಿ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಹೋಲಿನ ಚಂದ್ರ ಮಾಲಿ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿತ್ ಹರ್ಸ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಗೋನ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ದ ಟೈಟಲ್ ಹಿ ಟೋಲ್ ಮೀ ಬಟ್ ಮೈ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣಸ್ ವೇ ದೆನ್ ಆರ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಶಿವ ಪ್ರಾಪತ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಲ್ಯಾನ್ ಅನ್ಫಿನಿಷ್ಡ್ ಪ್ಲ್ಯಾನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎಸ್ಕಾನ್ ರೈಟ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಓಕೆ <laughs> Thank you. He approved it. Okay. So without further delay, Marge, we're very happy that we have you. Please give Marge a cartel. And uh, we'll start the class and we will hear more of what is it that your proper did not finish in ISKCON that we have to pick up and continue. Hare Krishna. We'll begin with bhajan. This is a beautiful bhajan by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. <coughs> It's something you're all familiar with. And uh, the actual title is Nama Kirtana. We also know it as Yasomati Nandana. So you can follow it on your phone. If you look it up, it's called Nama Kirtana. Yaso Mati Nandana Brajavara Nagara Gokula Hanjana Ha 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 na so ಜಸೋಮತಿ ನಂದನ್ನ ಭ್ರಜವಾರ ಘೋಘೂರಂಜನ Ka-ka-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-ra-
Prabhupada ki jai. Harinam Sankirtan Yuga Dharma ki jai. Hare Krishna. Nice to be back here with the addition to the transcendental family. Sri Sri Gauda Nittai. Of course, for you, it's been long term, well, three months now, huh? at least. For me, it's a debut. <laughs> Quite nice. The whole atmosphere is very transcendental. Simply by the presence of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Nityananda Ram, who have brought the entire Sankirtan movement, which is the Krishna conscious movement in this age, onto this planet Earth. So um, the topic today is a little detailed. It's quite, in order for me to cover all of the points, it would be way beyond the time limit that is available. So what we'll do is give a, a sort of an overview. As it was mentioned, the uh, unfinished business of Srila Prabhupada's program for establishing Krishna consciousness worldwide. Um, and that unfinished business is part four of a four-part program that Srila Prabhupada instituted as a means for bringing Krishna consciousness into the earth planet. Before we begin, Omagyan Timirandasya Gana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Pancha kalpa taru bischa kripa sindhu pe bacha patitanam bhavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namaho namaha jai sri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda sri advaita gadadhar sivasari hode vakta vrinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare hmm. So, in the year 1949, I believe it was, Srila Prabhupada wrote a treatise which we call, which is known as the Gita Nagari Concept. And the treatise was based on four principles that Mahatma Gandhi established for the development of the Indian society. Srila Prabhupada took those four principles as the basis for his development of the ISKCON movement. And what were those four principles? Gandhi was known as a, a saint among the, among the politicians and a politician amongst the saints. <laughs> so he used his position as a saintly person to influence political activity in order to expel the British. And he also had a plan for the development of uh, Indian society, which was both individual in terms of his own practice and also a plan, a larger plan for the development of the Indian culture, which was already developed in that way, but he wanted to bring it back in a more uh, we say personal way or a more adaptable way. 
And so Prabhupada took those four principles and he wrote what is called the Gita Nagari concept. You can, if you want to find that treatise, all you have to do is do a little research, you know, look for the Gita Nagari concept. And the first principle was, was holy books, holy names. Holy books and holy names. Gandhi as an individual, although he was involved with a lot of political activity, never neglected his daily prayers. He made it a point to always continue his personal worship within his own home and also within you know, a local society of friends where he would always worship his deity and also even when he would travel to different places he would also visit temples and also perform personal worship. He also was very enthusiastic to glorify the name of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Ram. <laughs> and so on a personal level, Gandhi was, along with being he's very much involved in political movements, he, he was very fixed in his worship and in his glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Srila Prabhupada, when he started the movement, how did he begin? He began with holy names. <laughs> taking Lord Chaitanya's mission as the foundation for the establishment of Krishna consciousness. Krishna Varnam, Tusa Krishna, Sangopangam, Saparshadam, Yagyai, Sankirtanai, Prayai, Yajantihi, Sumedasaha. This verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam establishes that those who actually have good intelligence perform the activity of Sankirtan, that is the congregational glorification of the Lord by chanting his holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. So Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So you see, if you two do a little historical research, that the early periodicals that began the Hare Krishna movement were the Back to Godhead magazines. In 1944, Srila Prabhupada began the principle of writing and publishing in a one or two page newsletter, which he called Back to Godhead. Of course, that was in, right in the midst of World War II. And he also spoke a lot about the political situation and the importance of practicing spiritual life as a means for overturning or over, overcoming the horrors of material life. And so that, that principle really establishes first, the first periodical in our movement, which is, it was called Back to Godhead magazine. And by going through those early issues, you see the majority of the articles and of the pictures, particularly, were devotees doing Sankirtan, Harinam Sankirtan in different places around the world, New York, Boston, um, Santa Fe, Mexico, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And these were some of the early centers that got established, Montreal, were some of the early centers that Prabhupada established. So he began his movement really with Harinam. When you see the old pictures when Prabhupada used to go out in the park, even in the very beginning, there were no Murdungas at the time. And he would have a little tom-tom drum. Mm -hmm. That tom-tom drum is still there. It's sitting on the Srila Prabhupada's altar in New Vrindavan. You can see the same drum. That was the drum that started the Hare Krishna movement in 1966. And Prabhupada would go out with his fledging followers and the few hippies that he somehow attracted <laughs> and they would go out and sing and dance in the park <laughs> and people would gather and Prabhupada would beat on the drum and chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and so that became the foundation by which Krishna consciousness started to spread one place to another. 
because Prabhupada understood this was the Lord, the Lord's desire to glorify the Lord by chanting his holy name and spreading that mercy to every, as many places as we could. And then Prabhupada sent devotees overseas in places like Germany and London and many of the major cities in Europe to uh, begin Krishna consciousness. It was all, was all centered around the same thing, Harinam Sankirtan. That's how the movement began. And uh, of course, nobody had much money in those days, so we were struggling in order to build centers and get whatever money we could from devotees who would join the movement and maybe give a little bit of their savings to help support the movement. There were no congregations in that day. There were no outside, people living outside. Everybody in the movement was a temple devotee, and that went on for many years. And then one day, then after some time, of course, Prabhupada was very enthusiastic to write books. Mm -hmm. And he started with Nara Bhakti Sutra. And after doing 13 verses, he decided to stop and he felt that more important was the nectar of devotion. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada and then penned Lord, and then summarized Rupa Goswami's. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindha, which we know as nectar devotion, which is the process by which one knows how to execute devotional service step by step from the, from the very beginning all the way up to the goal of Krishna consciousness, which is to develop one's love for Krishna. And um, so that became one of the more important books at the time. And it was mostly for the devotees at that time. And then Srila Prabhupada was thinking, of course he had many health challenges in those days, Prabhupada's age was 60, uh, 71, 72, and he was, uh, and then he had his, uh, he had two heart attacks, we all know about that, on the boat coming over on the Jaladuta, and then in, in 1967 he had his third heart attack, and one astrologer told him that Actually, this was the time he was supposed to leave. But Prabhupada prayed very seriously to Krishna that my mission it has not even developed yet, so please give me more time. And Krishna decided to fulfill that desire and Prabhupada stayed. But Prabhupada knew he could leave at any moment. And so he wanted to give us the... Uh, Tenth Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And at that time, there was no Bhagavatams out. Prabhupada had brought the first canto in three editions over from India, and then he used that basically to give his classes, along with teachings of Lord Chaitanya. He also summarized the teachings of Lord Chaitanya from Chaitanya Charitamrita, and well, produced another book called TLC. Jesus of Lord Chaitanya. And Prabhupada was giving classes 1966, 67, 68. And then around the year, the end of 1969 and around the beginning of 70, Prabhupada wanted, he was thinking, I want to give the devotees Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. But he knew he couldn't jump right to the 10th canto and do the 10th canto. So he summarized those pastimes into a book which we now know as Krishna book. <laughs> Krishna book. And that became a very popular book. When the book first came out, uh, Prabhupada was actually giving a lecture at one time, some public lecture, and the devotees had brought the book right during Prabhupada's lecture into the lecture, because Prabhupada was always waiting, when is Krishna book going to be published? And he was eager. As soon as he came out, the devotees came, and Prabhupada stopped the lecture right in the middle, accepted the book, there was 10 books that they brought uh, from the printing, and Prabhupada sold all 10 books right on the spot, <laughs> right in the lecture. He was so happy. Now, and here is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, in a very easy and understandable way, in the summary of this 10th canto. And one day, <laughs> 
one devotee, Jai C.C. Gornitai Ki Jai. One devotee was traveling and he had one Krishna book in his car. And he pulled into a gas station. This was in somewhere in, the, in California. And he got his car full of gas. And then the attendant came over and said, okay, uh, that'll be, uh, it was, I think it was, I don't know how much it was, maybe $10 at that time. And the devotees didn't have any money. So they pulled into a gas station, got a full tank of gas, and didn't have one penny to pay for it. <laughs> so the devotee who was driving, he said to the gas station attendant, can I give you this book in exchange for the gas? And uh, he handed him the Krishna book. And then the young man who was tending the pump, he said, yeah, I'm fine. So he took it. <laughs> And then the devotee reported back that he had to have, that what had happened, and the idea came that, hey, we could distribute books in the streets. Just from this apparent, you know, mistake of not having money and using the book as the franchise, the guy, the idea came maybe we can distribute books on the streets. So then we started to go around with back to God hands and. Uh, and Prabhupada had just finished his third attempt to write Bhagavad Gita. He did it in England, in India. It got stolen in India. He did it in, when he first came here. It got stolen the second time. Prabhupada was not, uh, you know, discouraged. He just came in the third time he put it out. And then there was a little blue book. It was more like a, uh, mostly just the verses without the Sanskrit. And that became, along with uh, Krishna book and back to God in magazines, the devotees start distributing books. And as Prabhupada really started to dive into doing translations, he was putting out Srimad Bhagavatams, and, and devotees then started distributing books on the street and became a, and in 1972, 73, as time went on, book distribution became so we were distributing millions of books every year. And from that money, temples were starting to open. So that was Prabhupada's second part of the mission. He wanted to open temples. All we had was houses converted into little storefronts or various places that the devotees would congregate in order to chant and uh, live. In fact, <laughs> there were no temples, but then finally, uh, uh, when the money started to come in, Prabhupada started to buy churches. <laughs> in those days, they were some of the Christian churches were no longer up to the functioning standing, and they become up for they became up for sale. And so we bought some churches. We also bought some Masonic lodges <laughs> and other places, and then we converted them into temples. Just like if you go to the Chicago Temple, that was a former Masonic lodge in here in Chicago and many other places and just go to Toronto, that was a, f a former Christian church. <laughs> and then temples started to open one after another. Book distribution was bringing in thousands and thousands of dollars. And Prabhupada started to open up temples everywhere and anywhere. So if you see around the world today, our temples, Radha Krishna temples, practically in every country around the world, you know, were very, what we say, ideal standards of worship. It's not easy to worship Radha Krishna, but Prabhupada wanted to give that to the human society, and he, you know, trained devotees on how to worship the deity and uh, arranged for different programs of education. So that was another part of Prabhupada's movement. First was holy books and holy, and holy, uh, holy names. The second part was temple worship. Of course, these things happened synonymously. But if you read the Gita Nagari concept, that was also there in uh, Gandhi's idea. He also wanted to renovate and restore the broken down temples throughout India. That was another big part of his plan. So Prabhupada 
also took that concept to expand temples all around the world. And there's a story where uh, when Prabhupada was in uh, was in 26 Second Avenue when he first started the movement, there was nothing there. Prabhupada one day was sitting on a park bench in one park. And one Iranian train conductor, he got curious, who is this gentleman in there sitting with all of these, you know, robes? And so he sat next to Prabhupada and then he began inquiring, who are you, where'd you come from? And Prabhupada said, well, you know, I come from India. I've come here to teach uh, eternal religious principles. And I have 108 temples, but they're separated by time. Now, if somebody told you that, you would think, hmm, maybe he, he's been tell, taking some LSD or something. So, but Prabhupada said it with such surety. Now, the man, of course, was very doubtful, but he liked Prabhupada. And then and they eventually the conversation. It's interesting because in, in the 90 years, 1990s, I think the beginning of the 90s, I had been done, I was doing prison preaching at that time, and I received a letter from one young man who was former uh, devotee in the Seattle, Washington Temple. And he said one day, one very elderly man came into the temple, and he walked right up to Prabhupada's Murti, sitting on the Vyasastan, and starts talking really loud. And he was saying, he, he said he was gonna do it, he did it, I didn't believe him. It was the same Iranian train conductor. <laughs> Prabhupada, uh, Krishna arranged for him to get the message, yeah, I told you, 108 temples. <laughs> so Prabhupada, and now we have, of course, 108 is just a small number. We have more, much more than that around the world now. Now this movement has spread by the desire of Lord Chaitanya using Srila Prabhupada's determined effort and his pure devotion to educate and to develop. Prabhupada was not only a great spiritualist, he's a visionary. He knew how to do things. He knew how to work on a practical level. He was a manager in a chemical factory before he became involved with Krishna consciousness in the West. He had the know-how how to do business, and he also knew how to arrange things. Prabhupada was an expert manager. <laughs> And because of his expertise, both in management and giving a spiritual direction, the movement spread fast. In fact, in, in the middle of the 1970s, it spread so fast, temples were opening and devotees were coming one after another, books were going out. And it was like a revolution everywhere. And uh, one senator from one state, I don't remember exactly, he said, he said, if this Krishna consciousness movement continues to spread the way it is, it'll take over the government in 10 years. He said that. And that was a fact. <laughs> they were afraid of what we were doing. It was very powerful. And the other part of Srila Prabhupada's movement was taken from the same principle that Gandhi had said, he, Gandhi's principle was Harijan, that people in India who were born in low class, they were considered to be outcasts, they were the Bungis and the Chamars, and Gandhi wanted to give them equal status with their, with everyone, that they could also worship on the same level of those who were, you know, in the Brahmin status. But Gandhi's idea was to just to rubber stamp people. But Prabhupada took the same idea and he said, you cannot just automa automatically bring people to that level of worship, you need to educate them. So Srila Prabhupada's movement was based on bringing people in and educating them in the science of bhakti yoga along with teaching them the practical application and at the same time initiating them into the Krishna conscious movement, giving them a new name, giving them principles to follow, and giving them a process by which they could gradually move from one status of Krishna consciousness to the next level. So one by one. 
And then the movement started to spread and Prabhupada initiated thousands and thousands of people. Temples were opening, uh, books were going out all over the world. It was a spiritual revolution. It was really powerful. And then uh, in 1974, prior to that age, Prabhupada, he talked a lot about Vanashram Dharma. He talked about establishing a society based on the four varnas, educating people according to. He took that verse from Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Varna Mayasrista Guna Karma Vibhagasaha. And Krishna says, the four types of people were created by me. And what are the four types? The Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Sudras. And these make up the social not spiritual, the social body of society. And therefore that is called varna and ashram, and educating people in spiritual matters and finding them their particular tendency, which is called swadharma. Swadharma means your natural material tendencies. There are people who have brahminical qualities, tendencies, people who have kshatriya qualities, the brahmins, they are more, they like to worship, they like to study the scriptures, they like to give direction. The kshatriyas are more like managers, they're protectors, they are people who, who care about people in general. They are more, they do welfare work for others. The vaishas take care of cows, cultivate the land, banking, commerce. And the sutras are supportive of the three varnas and they also engage in arts and crafts. So Prabhupada understood the different activities within the varnas, but in order to establish that, he needed a system of education. And therefore he came up with the idea of an ashram college. In 1974, prior to that, Prabhupada said, Van ashram can't be, cannot be established. Things are too topsy-turvy. But in 1974, he changed. He said, if chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is so easy, why are devotees not staying fixed in their spiritual life? Therefore, we have to establish this social system through education, evaluation, and ultimately engagement, engaging people according to their nature. And so then, then Prabhupada said, but before you could establish Van Ashram, it has to be done in an environment which is conducive to that. And he said, the only, way you can, the only place you can do that is in the farms. And for he established these farm communities. So I'll read one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam and purport. The purport is very powerful. It's a little lengthy, but try to listen up. <laughs> And the verse is from the first canto, 10th chapter, verse number four. It's called Departure of Lord Krishna for Dwarka. A translation, during the reign of Maharaj Yudhisthira, the clouds showered all the water that people needed and the earth produced all the necessities of man in profusion. Due to its fatty milk bag and cheerful attitude, the cow used, used to motion the grazing ground with milk. Srila Prabhupada's purport is very strong, listen up. The basic principle of economic development is centered on land and cows. The necessity of human society are food grains, fruits, milk, minerals, clothing, wood, etc. One requires all these items to fulfill the material needs of the body. Certainly one doesn't require flesh and fish or iron tools and machinery. During the regime of Maharaj Yudhisthira, all over the world there were regulated rainfalls. Rainfalls are not in control of the human being. The heavenly king Indradev is the controller of rains, and he is a servant of the Lord. When the Lord is obeyed by the king and the people under the king's administration, there are regulated rains from the Harayans, and these rains are the causes of all varieties of productions on the land. Not only do regulated rains help ample production of grains and fruits, but when they combine with astronomical influences, there is ample production of valuable stones and pearls. 
Grains and vegetables can sumptuously feed a man and animals, and a fatty cow delivers enough milk to supply a man sumptuously with vigor and vitality. If there's enough milk, enough grains, enough fruit, enough cotton, enough silk, and enough jewels, then why do the people need cinemas, houses of prostitution, slaughterhouses, etc.? What is the need of artificial, luxurious life of cinema, cars, radio, flesh, and hotels? Has this civilization produced anything but quarreling individually and nationally? Has this civilization enhanced the cause of equality and fraternity by sending thousands of men into the hellish factory in a war fields at the whim of a particular man? It is said here that the cows used to moisten the pasturing gland with milk because their milk bags were fatty and the animals were joyful. Do they not require therefore proper protection for a joyful life by being fed with a sufficient quantity of grass in the field? Why should men kill cows for their selfish purposes? Why should man not be satisfied with grains, fruits, milks, which combined together can produce hundreds and thousands of palatable dishes? Why are there slaughterhouses all over the world to kill innocent animals? Innocent animals. Maharaj Prikshit, grandson of Maharaj Yudhisthir, while touring his vast kingdom, saw a man attempting to kill a cow. The king at once arrested the butcher and chastised him sufficiently. Should not a king or an executive head protect the lives of the poor animals who are unable to defend themselves? Is this humanity? Are not the animals of a country citizens also? Then why are they not allowed to, well, then why are they allowed to be butchered in organized slaughterhouses? Are these the signs of equality, fraternity, and nonviolence? Therefore, in contrast with the modern advanced civilized form of government, an aristocracy like Maharaj Yudhisthira is far superior to so-called dem democracy in which animals are killed and a man less than an animal is allowed to cast votes for another less than an animal man. We are creatures of material nature. And this is a very important point. We are creatures of material nature. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said that the Lord himself is the seed-giving father and material nature is the mother of all living beings in all shapes. Thus mother material nature has enough foodstuffs both for animals and for men by the grace of the Father Almighty Lord Sri Krishna. The human being is the elder brother of all living beings. He is endowed with intelligence more powerful than animals for realizing the course of nature and the indications of the Almighty Father. Human civilization should depend on the production of material nature without artificially attempting economic development to turn the world into a chaos of artificial greed and power only for the purpose of artificial luxuries and sense gratification. This is but the life of dogs and hogs. Now, Prabhupada summarizes everything nicely. Um, if it's an an bhavanti bhutani parjanyan an when there is sufficient rain, when there is sufficient jagya, when there is sufficient rain, when the rains come, the land becomes fertile, one can cultivate the land and take care of their needs for all the food they need, automatically by Mother Nature. The cow, the cow is God's gift to human society. Uh, now we have cars. <laughs> we forgot about cows. <laughs> of course, many of you who grew up in India, you still have many memories of living in such an environment where a cow was a very big part of the environment and also of the family's the family needs. The cow, provide, the Prabhupada says, provides sufficient food in the form of milk. The cow also fertilizes the field by walking on the fields. Their hooves actually make the fields fertile for planting of crops. The cow dung can be used to, for cooking. You take cow dung, you mix it with patty. You, you see it in India, and they do that. They put it on the walls, they put it on the houses. After it dries out, and then they cook with it. I lived in New Vrindavan for 20 years, and I was a cook for a while. We didn't have cow dung. We didn't use the cow dung. We used wood 
for cooking. And Srila Prabhupada said, you know, if, if you want first class cooking, cow dung. <laughs> Second class, he said, wood. Third class, gas. Haribo. And we won't say what the last class is. <laughs> Maybe we go into some of your homes and you'll find it's called electricity. <laughs> I was in Detroit about a month ago, yeah, exactly a month ago, and uh, I was talking to one gentleman and his wife, this was a while back, she was sick at that time. The doctor told her, you can't cook because if you cook with the electric stove, it's bad for your health. Even the doctors would see then, you know, being around that type of environment is not healthy. So we, we live in a very polluted society because we've artificially taken what n material nature has given, manufactured into products and sold back to human beings in the form of commodities and either ne apparent necessities or even various forms of luxuries. In the year 1850, mm -hmm. a I mean, in the, in recently, a statistic was taken, this was about 40 years ago, but in the year 1850, it was understood that 95% of the commodities that were available on the common market for people in general were considered to be necessities. And 5% were extra, we call that luxuries. Now if you take the same categories and you do the same math, you get the opposite. It's 95% is luxuries, 5% is necessities. And this is, this is a statistic taken in the United States about 40 years ago. And of course, things have also developed in the same way. So we live in a very artificial lifestyle. Uh, we don't depend on nature, we rape nature, and resell it back to people in the form of different commodities and give them some kind of franchise which is called money in order to live. <laughs> Here it mentions how God actually produces valuable resources. It mentions in the purport, it says that when regulated rains from, come from the horizon, they, they, and then when they combine with certain astrological influences, there are jewels, gems, and various precious metals produced simply by rain, simply by rain. And it's understood there's a constellation called Swati. And when it rains during the Swati constellation in the heavens, the rain falls on the head of a snake, becomes jewels, falls on the head of an elephant, becomes gems, falls in the ocean, becomes pearls. <laughs> so God produces everything, and then there's gold, silver, lapis lazuli, rubies, and emeralds, diamonds, various other things. That's real wealth. <laughs> real wealth comes from the earth. But everything has been usurped by the administration of the world today and resold back into artificial ingredients. And so Prabhupada understood. He understood that uh, in order to propagate Krishna consciousness in an atmosphere that is conducive to the execution of Krishna consciousness, we need to live a more a, a, sim, a lifestyle that is simple, more, more simplified. And therefore he wanted to establish these farm communities and to develop an ashram dharma on these farm communities. Cows not only produce uh, food, uh, uh, cow dung for cooking, but there's a machine you can get and you can take cow down, you can process it, you can make methane gas, you can heat your house. You don't need heating fuel from the outside. And Prabhupada's program was very simple. He talked a lot about this. If you read the Bhagavatam of Pesli, the first canto, he talked a lot about how to develop this more simplified lifestyle. And therefore, when he left the planet in 1977, during that last year, he spoke a lot about, he said, establish these farms. He said, this is the fourth part of the mission. Gandhi wanted to establish village culture. He wanted to make each of the individual villages self-sufficient in India. 
That was his desire. He, of course, he never was able to get to that program, but he actually started it in some places to make the individual the villages self-sufficient, where they wouldn't have to depend on the outside world for whatever they needed. And Prabhupada's idea was the same thing for the ISKCON movement, establish these. Uh, and he could see the deterioration of the Western culture, the Western society would gradually continue to deteriorate where people would be struggling hard just for the basic necessities of life. So Prabhupada was a visionary. Therefore, in that last part of his movement, he said, just before he left, he said, 50% of my movement is still unfinished. And since then, and that was in 1977, there has been an attempt, but a small attempt to somehow or other execute that last part by establishing farm communities. We have our Gita Nagari, we have New Vrindavan, we have New Dam, there's Saranagrati, there's a few places. And there's many, many individual smaller little units around the world and that devotees have developed with a few families working together doing agriculture and cow care. Uh, and this is what Srila Prabhupada saw as the future of both, not only the world, not of a movement, but of the world in general. He said society will collapse. He said in 1973, he said in 50 years, this whole society will be finished. If you calculate 1973 to 50 years, what year do you get? 2023. Hmm. You can see it is deteriorating really fast right now. But Prabhupada knew, because he could see, and he, he explains it, that anything that's based on money is a false foundation. Money is not a foundation for human culture. Values, tradition, uh, morality, uh, family values, cultural values, um, what else, spiritual values. These are the things that make up the character of a human being and establish a society that is wholesome. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the first canto, Srila Prabhupada said, you need three things in order to establish a wholesome society. Brahminical culture, cow protection, cow care, and worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All three. So Prabhupada's program was not simply just chanting, dancing, and, and doing worship. He understood we need a social system to support the lifestyle that is conducive to spiritual life and to human culture, human wholesomeness, human health. And uh, he spoke a lot about it. If you go through his books, especially his lectures, he spoke so much about the need for simplifying our life and coming back to a more simplified life. And it sounds quite revolutionary. Now we have our big houses, we have our big homes, we got cars, we can push, push buttons and things happen, right? And now everything is so modern and so automated, right? They got, now they got cars that drive by themselves. I was sitting with one of my friends in, in Pittsburgh about a couple of weeks ago, and he said, let's go for a ride in my Tesla, okay? And I was sitting in it there, and he's sitting back doing nothing, the car's going by itself, turning the corner, stopping, going, and I, and he's having fun. His wife doesn't like it at all. She thinks it's dangerous, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, we've become somewhat subservient to machines. <laughs> Everything is a machine, you know. And they're be coming up with more and more technological devices in order to place human culture, human activities. And pretty soon they're going to get rid of the human beings because <laughs> then they'll become useless. Everything will be a robot society. It's moving in that direction. So Prabhupada could foresee that. And he talked about, he said, yeah, when, you, when a, something is established on money as the foundation for success, and it's a fault, faulty foundation. He said, if you got money, you can do things. If you got money, even if you do something wrong, you can buy your way out of it. 
Money is a cover-up. Money is a false sense of advancement in society. And therefore, and especially this paper money, Prabhupada talked about that in 1973, the artificial form of wealth called paper money. They give you a piece of paper, you work hard. The government says, hey, you can do anything with that. You can get the plane. Okay. Now, if the government goes, what happens? Your paper's useless. Just like I was in India in 2016, and, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi decided to pull back some of the denominations. <laughs> Maybe you also were affected by that. And so, unless you could prove that the certain denominations, I think it was the 1,000 note in the law, um, that uh, unless you could prove that you actually got that in a legal way, otherwise you could not cash it in, it was worthless. People were burning money in the streets. We saw that in India. Um, millions and millions of pounds were being burnt because it was useless. The government said no. It's happening again, I don't know if you know it again. It's, uh, they're, they're pulling about the 2,000 note now. So change your 2,000s into 500s now. All the governments, all the banks in India are no longer circulating the 2000. And that's the name, Modi's gonna do it again, so. So, uh, anyway, the point is, it's just paper. That's what it is. Jai Sisi Gornitai Ki Jai. So, my point is that the unfinished business of Srila Prabhupada's movement was these farm communities and to establish a lifestyle, and particularly for people who live in families. Not so much for the brahmacharis and the sannyasis who are very mobile and can go from place to place, but those who have families, who have children, who want a stable environment for, for a livelihood and for their, for their uh, practice of spiritual life at the same time. So Prabhupada could understand that this was the future of our movement. So I produced one little book. You can see it on the table. It's called Krishna's Way, Simple, uh, Simple Krishna's Lay Natural Living, which I include a lot of the things that, that I mentioned tonight. And mostly of it, it's, it focuses on Srila Prabhupada's statements for the future, uh, food production, cow protection, Van Ashram and a more simplified lifestyle where we don't have to work so hard. Now you might think, oh my God. But it's not like it was in India. You can still have modern things. You can still live in a very nice environment with many of the luxuries that we still have. But still, the basic principle is agriculture. Alban said, grow your own food. He said the food that grown in our farms is a hundred times more nutritious than what you buy in the stores. What you get in the stores is full of herbicides, pesticides, various chemicals. You take a, gla you take a quart of milk, you buy it in the store. You take a quart of milk, you get it from Gita Nagri. You put it in the refrigerator. Which one will last longer? the one you buy from the store, because it's full of chemicals. <laughs> You're drinking more like chemicals instead of the actual real stuff, uh, pasteurization. So the whole society is practically polluted, and to find actually good food, healthy air, and various types of uh, medicines that are not detrimental. It's a, I, I have this on video, this is by doctors who have done research that the number three cause of death in the United States, this is in the US, this is recent, this is not something new, is the cure that the doctors administrate to the patients. The number three cause of death is the cure that the people get, come in with some ailment, they die of the cure. Haribo. Welcome to modern society. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is, this is statistics, and this is not done by people who are trying to attack the medical, and these are people in the medical industry who are seeing this and are concerned about people's welfare. So, uh, therefore, and Prabhupada's mission was learn herbs. 
herbs have all of the medicines that God has given to us that can cure any disease. Srila Prabhupada talks about his own life, how when he was a young man he had a toothache. And the doctors wanted to take out the tooth, but Prabhupada didn't want to lose the tooth, he wanted to heal the tooth. And nobody could heal it, so Prabhupada went to one shaman, a man living in the forest, he was just a, you know, a sadhu, and he was directed by one of his friends to meet this man. So the man saw Prabhupada's tooth, he went and picked a particular herb, put it on the side of Prabhupada's cheek, and all of the germs went out, the tooth was healthy again. And this is one of hundreds of examples how herbs actually come, and where, where the modern medicines, they take these things from nature and they mix it with various kinds of ingredients and resell it back to you in the form of medicine. But you can learn that whole science yourself. There's one devotee here in, what is it? It's in uh, New Taliban. Uh, Dwij Buja, he's created this business, uh, herbs, called the Blue Boy Herbs. <laughs> I was with him one day, he was showing me, walking through the forest and showing me all of the different herbs. I don't know anything, you know, all, everything looks green to me and different colors of green, I have no idea. Some browns are also there. So uh, he's showing me this is for this ailment, this is for this, yeah, this cures, this, this gives vitality. And this helps, uh, you know, circulation of blood. Uh, so he's learned the whole science. Prabhupada said, learn that. He said, you make your own medicines. Forget about doctors. <laughs> doctors are good. They were there even in Vedic times. But doctors are just there to administer, not to prescribe. Prescription is given by Krishna himself. <laughs> uh, we have a doctor in the back, and she's my disciple. She's um, not very happy with this lecture. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so God has arranged everything. I mean, you know, just delivering babies. People used to deliver at home. There used to be a nurse there to assist the, the woman in bringing babies into the world. And now we live in a society where everybody lives in a what is called a nuclear family. Why? That means husband, wife, kids, one house, right? Well, where is Vedic culture and even Indian culture, which is the foundation, which is the offspring of Vedic culture, people lived in groups, right? There was all of the family members, the brothers, the sisters, their children, nephews, everybody lived together. It was more of a supportive environment. It says in the scriptures, if you want to raise a child, it takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child. So these are the advantages of natural living, as now everything has been economically franchised. And therefore, you have the nuclear families are created in order to create an economic interest for big business. You sell everyone a car, you sell everyone a house, you sell everyone, you know, all of the ingredients that make up a, a modern lifestyle, and each pie person buys that. Just like I was in, I was in preaching in Cincinnati, Ohio, this was many years ago, and I had one friend, he invited me to his house, and I came in, and as soon as we walked into the living, liberated, uh, the living room, there was, the, his father was watching TV. Okay, nice. And there was a curtain dividing the room. And I went on the other side of the curtain and his brother was watching another TV. <laughs> Same room with a curtain. And then I thought, all right, well, they just, two different channels. Then I looked, they were watching the same channel. <laughs> then I had to ask, I think my curiosity went beyond me. And so the answer was, just in case one of them wants to change the channel. <laughs> so yeah, that, that keeps peace in the family. <laughs> so yeah, everybody has to have a 
cell phone, everybody has to have a car, everybody has to have all of the muddy ingredients that make up today's society so you can live you know, peacefully, <laughs> supposedly. But this is just an economic adventure by modern capitalism in order to get people to work, buy, and, and spend every amount of money, and that's where all the money goes, it goes to buying things you don't even need. <laughs> So this lifestyle, as Prabhupada, I mean Prabhupada's purport is very, very bright to the point that we don't need these things, everything is provided by God. I'll read another interesting purport here. This is from the 10th canto. This is with Nanda Maharaj and Vasudev. This is short. He said, and Vasudeva is inquiring from Krishna's father, Nanda Maharaj. He says, my dear friend Nanda, in the place where you live, where you are living with your friends, is the forest favorable for the animals, the cows? I hope there is no disease or inconvenience. The place must be full of water, grass, and other plants. Prabhupada goes on to explain, for human happiness, one must care for the animals, especially the cows. Vasudev therefore inquired whether there was good arrangements for the animals where Nanda Maharaj lived. For the proper pursuit of human happiness, there must be arrangements for the protection of cows. This means that there must be forests and adequate pasturing grounds full of grass and water. If the animals are happy, there will be an ample supply of milk, from which human beings will benefit by deriving many milk products with which they too live happily. As enjoined in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Krishi go raksha avani jam barsha kama svabhava jam. Without giving proper facility to the animals, how can human society be happy? Prabhupada explains that as long as they are killing cows, human society will never be peaceful, no matter what arrangements they make. Cow is very dear. It's, it mentions in the Bhagavatam that there are five categories of living entities that require protection. And society must make arrangements for the protection of these five people, either on an individual level or on a social level. What are the five categories? Women children, old people, cows, and brahmanas. These are the five it's mentioned. And after explaining and mentioning these five, and what are the care programs, two are given preference over the other three, and that is cows and brahmanas. And out of the two, it, the conclusion is cows. How dear cows are to the Lord and how important they are to human society. But therefore, we have a society that doesn't appreciate cows and simply thinks of them as an economic adventure to get as much milk for sale for human society and ultimately for various types of uh, exploitation. And it says here, the people are raising cattle to send to the slaughterhouse that is a great sin. By this demonic enterprise, people are ruining their chance for truly human life. Because they are not giving any importance to the instructions of Krishna, the advancement of so-called civilization resembles the crazy efforts of men in a lunatic society, lunatic asylum, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Pretty strong words, but actually it's not an overstatement not an overstatement when you look at it and see it in the light of what is actually human culture and human values this society is contrary completely and so Prabhupada is giving us the formula he said establish these and recently I gave this lecture in one place and and I hadn't known I had known this before but one man was very enthusiastic to make a response to what I said he said, you know, Maharaj, there in certain places in India, and I had the experience that when cows are there, if people in the family are sick, then someone will go to the cow 
which is part of that family also, whisper in the cow's ear that this person is sick with this disease, the cow will go and find an herb somewhere in the environment, eat that herb, and that milk will be used as medicine for the person who's sick. And then uh, I, was, I was amazed to see how, how, you know, how in tune with life the cow is. And then someone else told me, Mara, it's, it's even more than that. He said, the cow knows who's sick in the family. You don't even have to tell it. It'll go and eat that herb automatically without even being told. When cows become part. Therefore, it says that, uh, just like we were having a, a wedding program yesterday, very nice, it was really quite nice. But one of the points in the wedding was asking the bridegroom, how many animals do you have <laughs> before, you, m m before you actually enter into a marriage? Animals were considered to be equity, luxury, and opulence. And so that is real value, and especially the cow. The cow is very dear to Krishna. I just mentioned a few of the valuable commodities that the cow provides, but they're unlimited. And if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, what is the name of the highest planet in the spiritual world? Go car? Go automobile? Ford? Krishna's planet is what? Ford, Chevy? What is it? Goloka. <laughs> the planet of the cows. <laughs> well, you might think, wow, the highest planet in the spiritual world is named after the cow. Amazing. And there's much more. The cow is not only materially very beneficial, spiritually also. <laughs> There's, people were telling me there's a certain nerve in the cow's spine that c connects with higher authority. They get energy that's coming from higher realms and they use that energy to, and, and to give back to human society in various ways. Cow is really God's special gift on the human society. But we're seeing the opposite in today's modern society and therefore society is going to hell <laughs> because of uh, abuse of that animal. It's not a small reaction. Probably, you even see, even great philanthropist George Bernard Shaw, uh, many hundreds of years ago, wrote that because people gore themselves on the dead flesh of animals, there are wars. <laughs> wars. So war is an outcome of cow killing. <laughs> because that reaction to that sinful activity has to go somewhere and it comes out into the society that cultivates or propagates the abuse of cows. So it's much, so much we can say about this uh, topic. But the point is that I'm looking to see how much we actually realize that what Prabhupada is saying in terms of the future of the world is actually a vision that we need to establish in the world, and that is these, these farm communities. Um, so Prabhupada was not an ordinary person. He was not just a great spiritualist. He was, an, he was sent to this material world by Krishna to propagate eternal religious principles. And that, that's also documented and Prabhupada, when Prabhupada, uh, we were in, in um, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj's room many years ago in Mayapur, and many of the senior devotees came to congregate and discuss and talk about their experiences with Srila Prabhupada. So we had a session, one very, uh, one very wonderful devotee, his name was Bhavananda, he had much association with Prabhupada. He was saying that one day I was with Srila Prabhupada and I was massaging Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was un unusually quiet that day, because when you're with Prabhupada, he's always talking about Krishna. 
He always wanted to keep us aware of the importance of our relationship with Krishna and the whole process of Krishna consciousness. Well, Prabhupada was always very vocal, always speaking about Krishna, connecting everything to Krishna and devotional service. This time Prabhupada was very quiet. Um, this one, this quietness went on for some time, and then one time, at one point Prabhupada broke the silence. And it was quite mystical, I was describing. He said, the devotee said that Prabhupada started to talk about himself. He said, I was with Krishna in the spiritual world. Krishna said, come to this material world and preach. I said, material world? I said to Krishna, it's a horrible place. Horrible place. I didn't want to go. <laughs> But Krishna said to me, no, you go, you write some books, and I'll protect you. So I came. And Krishna wanted me to come and do this work because it was actually the time for the establishment of the Yuga Dharma. As Lord Chaitanya proceeded, Krishna, or followed Krishna's appearance in the world at the beginning of this, this, this century. Uh, not this century, but this millennium. And so Srila Prabhupada was a manifestation of Krishna's mercy upon the world to bring about eternal religious principles as society was gradually going more and more away from God and towards economic development and various forms of sense gratification. We're in the midst of a very interesting time in history. There's a great conflict that's going on in the world now between Sura and Asura, <laughs> the demons and the devotees. And the world is, uh, these two groups are the small groups, the devotees and the atheists, the demons. The middle road is people in general. But as time is going on, the middle road is becoming smaller and smaller and these other areas become. Krishna consciousness is spreading fast. But the demons are also moving fast <laughs> in order to exploit and to control the world. They have their plans. And this is being documented. And Prabhupada also understood that. He said in 1972, he said the demons are increasing. And he said they will give you more and more trouble. He said, but don't worry, Krishna will protect you. As long as you chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and stay close to association. Devotees follow the program that I've given you. You'll always be protected from the influence of demonic rule within society. And he gave the example. He said, Prahlad Maharaj, he was harassed by his father, big demon, but still Krishna saved him. Devaki, by Kamsa, Krishna saved him. So Prabhupada understood, you know, we're, we're at a time and that he could foresee. And of course, Prabhupada came at that time because Krishna knew this was the time that we needed to revive eternal religious principles. So he sent Srila Prabhupada. Of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission was to spread to every town and village. So this movement is not just another religious movement in the world to somehow or other, you know, worship the Lord. It's actually a movement to restructure the entire Western culture into a God-conscious society based on knowledge, tradition, and values, and spiritual education. And uh, of course, this Van Ashram system is the foundation by which people can work according to their, spirit, their material proclivities and can contribute to the spiritual welfare of society by engaging in service to the Supreme Lord. And this is Srila Prabhupada's vision. So we should be aware of this as devotees who are practicing in Krishna. What was Prabhupada's idea and what is this Krishna conscious movement? Prabhupada said, I came to turn the whole world upside down. <laughs> he wanted to make a revolution, not simply just open a few temples and do a little worship here and there. He wanted, he, and you, you, you would listen to Srila Prabhupada, he talked about politics, he talked about sociology, he talked about economics, he talked about military, he talked about archaeological, he talked about ecological, he talked about everything in relationship to spiritual values and Krishna's way of living. He connected everything back to that. 
uh, if we read Srila Prabhupada's books and understand deeper what he came to do and what was the desire of the Supreme Lord in sending Srila Prabhupada at this very critical time in human history, then we will become a very part of, of an instrument to bring about spirituality in the world and that's the greatest contribution that people need. People are suffering nowadays, there's no question about it. There's a lot of suffering in the world. And therefore, Bhakti Siddhartha used to say, bring spiritual life in, you bring Krishna consciousness, this is the solution to all problems. When you're Krishna conscious, you have the tools, you have everything at your disposal to solve all problems of life. So, um, therefore, read Srila Prabhupada's books, and those of you who are interested, I a little small book there. Many of the quotes of Srila Prabhupada are in that book, along with some lectures that I gave on this specific topic. And it's also for a small donation of six dollars. If you can't afford six, give five. If you can't afford five, take the book anyway. <laughs> or just give a donation. My idea is to get this message out more and more because I think it's a very important part of the future of the society, the future of the world, that we understand what Srila Prabhupada has given to us in the form of this Krishna consciousness movement. So thank you very much for listening. Hare Krishna. Any questions? Comments? The question is not related with uh, what you give a little to it. Okay. So the question I have, <coughs> I am doing some my service, devotional service for uh, various temples, some of the houses for the, when we have Bhaktivik's program or other programs, or some events, regionally, regional events we have. So sometimes what happens, like uh, when I do my service, but uh, there are some people, some devotees, some officers, they have some ego created, some behavior, some attitude, or some credit issues they have. So they don't allow me to perform those kind of service. So in those kind of situation, how we can continue and how we can concentrate on those kinds so that my devotional service will not break and I can continue that. So if I understand correctly, you're trying to implement different programs like Bhakta Vriksha and Namhat and other, and you're getting some resistance from what sector of society? Yeah, like some of the devotees, some of the officers, like temple. Suppose I'm doing perform service, but they maybe have some issue of the credit we, or issue of the to, egos. We have to work in a cooperative way. If we don't cooperate, at least amongst ourselves, how can we make a difference to people on the outside? So when there's ever, I mean, Prabhupada writes in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he says devotees appear to be disunited because they have different understandings on how to serve the Lord. So, but we can accommodate various ways to, under, to serve the Lord as long as it's in relationship to devotional service, in other words. And there is variety in, un in unity. Unity is that we're all devotees, we're all trying to serve the Lord. And the variety is how we, we execute our different services. So in the material world, people cannot be united because they, there's, there's no center. Everybody is a different, everyone has their idea of what is important. Therefore, there's no unity. That's why if you look at the material world, there's more and more diversity. And the lack of unity just creates more diversity and then you have more and more diversity, that's all. But our society is that devotees have the understanding, we're all devotees, we're trying to serve the Lord, we're trying to make spiritual advancement. Therefore, we have, we have different ways we can offer service 
accordingly. Therefore, we should appreciate and encourage people to serve according to their capacity, their nature, as long as it's in line with the process of devotional service. So if we fight over these little things, then, you know, how can we, you know, work together in a cooperative way to make a difference and show people in general that we have something to offer? So therefore, Prabhupada was very clear. He said, he said, um, you'll show your love for me by how much you cooperate together to push on this Krishna conscious movement. So there may be differences of opinion on how to do things, but that shouldn't be the cause of dissension or even enmity or envy. We have to work it out, that's all. And they have to discuss it and use religious principles, Srila Prabhupada's instructions as a foundation by which we understand how to overcome the differences. Prabhupada gave us everything. We just have to understand. And, but the mood is, it's not so much what I think is right, but what's best for propagating Krishna consciousness. What will please Krishna? What will please the spiritual master? And of course, the cooperative spirit is very pleasing. Even though the ideal service may not go on, if there's a cooperative mood, Krishna is very pleased. Krishna will show his mercy when we, when we make an effort for cooperation. So envy, enmity, various times of, you know, pro individual programs. Prabhupada said the disease is personal interest. The disease is personal interest. We have to keep Krishna's interests, the spiritual master's interests foremost. That we can cooperate around. Personal interests will, can, will cause us to simply fight and go away. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Haribo. Does that make sense? Anyone else? Yes, Mataji. <laughs> Haripa Maharaj, thank you so much for um, the nice class. As you were talking, I, I was thinking of this analogy that um, Srila Prabhupada gave us about the frog in the pot of water. Oh. How when the, the, you turn the temperature very, very gradually, the, pot doesn't real, the frog doesn't realize that it's boiling until it's too late and then it's already cooked. Hmm. So Prabhupada has given us this um, prediction or this, this insight, you know, as you said, back in 73, he said, you know, society will be finished in 50 years, and now here we are, 2023. And I was just wondering, can you give, it just, it seems as though we hear these things, and we see the things around us, and yet it's like, oh, you know, it can't be that bad, it'll get better soon, and you know, even, you know, it, 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 it will never get to that, it will never get to that point, something will happen. And yet we see every day, Things are getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse. Food is going up. You know, everything is getting more expensive. Yeah. So, is there a way? Can you, can you give us some advice on maybe one or two things that we can do to kind of keep this idea of of self sustainability? Of what when you're when we're trapped in in our jobs and we're doing living this day-to-day -day existence of like pay the bills, look after the kids, do this, you know, make sure the mortgage is paid. It seems difficult to think of anything beyond like how to prepare for yeah. what Srila Prabhupada said is going to happen. So is there something that we can do that can kind of well, shock us out of that? Yeah. There is things on the immediate level and then things on the larger level or on the, on the group level. Uh, so Prabhupada's vision was to gradually withdraw from the uh, to the withdraw for being dependent on this society, and create a society within the society which would become a macrocosm of a new society, and then eventually, as that expands, it will become more and more the the model. So, 
if we still are working for the non-devotees out there, and then we, are, we have to sacrifice some of our values and plug into that value system in order to maintain whatever we need in terms of finances and uh, facilities. That, that So we're still dependent on that. The idea is to pull your dependence back away from that, and that's the point of I was making in this, to, to, to become more insolent, and more dependent not so much on the external society, but depend more on Krishna, nature, and in the social, economic, and uh, spiritual values that make up the practice of Krishna consciousness. So that takes a plan. <laughs> And immediately what we can do is just keep strong in our spiritual life, which will help us to become less affected by the fact that we still are dependent on the uh, society. Because if we get weak, we become overwhelmed, and then we become influenced. If we become influenced, then we compromise. If we compromise, then our values are no longer important anymore. It's what is our needs become more important than our values. Uh, just like I was mentioning today in class, that uh, I was talking to some senior devotees, one devotee was telling me that people consider their japa to be uh, a interference with their life. In other words, I have to do 16 rounds, but I still all have all of these other things in the world to do with job and family responsibilities and other activities. So in other words, they organize their japa around their material responsibilities rather than organizing our material responsibilities around our japa, which is the foundation for our, because we are spiritual beings, you know, we have material responsibilities, but if they become the, the main thing, then we lose our focus on life. And ultimately, our goal is to become purified from all material desires and go back home, back to Godhead. That is the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement. It's not to make a nice material arrangement. That may come by the grace of Krishna, but it's not the goal. So to e emphasize and to reinforce our spiritual life as a community, we get strength and we also become under, we can also manage easier our material responsibilities. I think putting spirituality first and foremost is the most important part of that answer of your question, making that foremost. When you're strong in your spiritual practice, you're less affected by the uh, material energy. Prabhupada used to say, uh, Maya is as strong as you are weak. <laughs> if we become strong, then Maya becomes, their influence becomes weak. If the frog is, you know, aware that it's getting boiled, it'll get out of it. <laughs> Instead of waiting to you know, it becomes impossible. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's not an easy question to sort out in terms of, because we're plugged in. <laughs> and the thing is to gradually unloosen the plug and replug it more into our, into community. Community is the foundation for all success, both material and spiritual developing community. I think that was Bhakti Tirtha Swami's message too. He talked a lot about the importance of community as the foundation for the human culture, for spiritual practice. <laughs> Anything else? Um, 
Maharaj. God, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you can even say, Maharaj, you're in Maya, uh, you know, I think, you know, you're too fanatical. You can, you can say anything you want. I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're ready to hear your, you know, if you feel like there's something you want to express, please express it in the form of a question so we can understand it. Don't walk away and think, well, I wanted to ask Maharaj that question, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> ask your questions. Maharaj, uh, while you were answering that question, you mentioned early on in the answer that you know, chanting is a very important aspect and even a foundation of, a, of our spiritual lives. Um, like, how can we actually make that into a reality? Is it like there's some kind of affirmations we should tell us, something we should read? Is there some mantra that reinforces that? Or Well, first of all, you, you have to know, at least theoretically, Maybe not, you haven't realized it, but at least you, that the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the foundation for the execution of Krishna consciousness. All of our spiritual advancement springs from the quality and activity of our chanting, both japa and kirtan. And this is mentioned throughout the scriptures. Therefore, anyone who chants the holy names of the Lord is actually recognized by the Supreme Lord as being a great personality. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a small thing to chant Japa or to chant Kirtan. It's actually, in this age, it's the highest form to, that, of glorification of the Supreme Lord. Krishna's name is Krishna. Nama Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purnya Sudya Nitya Mukta Binatvam Nami Nami no. Krishna's name is Krishna. You can associate with the Supreme Lord through sound. <laughs> if you practice how to chant nicely, with attention, with devotion. But we think, oh, yeah, I got so many things to do. If I chant, I get nothing done. But if I work, I get something done. That's Maya. <laughs> That's the mode of passion. Seeing re material results as success in our life as opposed to spiritual event, spiritual purification. You can get so many material results in this life and then you die and you get another birth to pick up where you left off in the last life. But if you purify your heart, you can awaken your love for Krishna, and you can go back home, back to Godhead, and don't have to come back to this material world, and live eternally in the spiritual world in full knowledge and in unlimited happiness. That is the nature, it's not only just a, a lofty goal, it's actually the nature of the living being's existence. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prima Sadhu Kambunai Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodiye Udoi In the hearts of all living beings, natural love for Krishna is there. It's just a matter of bringing it out. So that is the real success of life, to develop one's love for the Supreme Lord, which is the actual goal of life. If you, people ask, well, what is the goal of human life? The goal of human life is to awaken your love for God. Mm -hmm. The goal of human life is not to have big houses and nice cars and, you know, nice lawns. <laughs> these, are, these are okay. We don't put, you know, we don't knock those. But ultimately, what is it? The human, the human facility is relationship and not simply uh, external. So relationships are based on on uh, quality, and that quality is based on service. And when we serve Krishna, when we serve others, we actually develop our actual propensity of uh, the soul's existence. Service is the soul's existence, and the ultimate service is to serve the Lord and serve the devotees of the Lord. These are the two ways by which the soul finds happiness through service.
Thank you very much. I'm not making this up. I'm just repeating what's in the book. What's in the book. So. Anything else? Okay. So, what's next? Hmm. Google. Okay. Thank you very much. And if you are a little curious, we have some books there. Please take a look and uh, get a book. We keep it in very nominal so everyone can get make it affordable for anyone. Hare Krishna.